Okay, everybody. Um, thanks for uh, attending the third incarnation of our uh, online reading group. Uh, today we have Ra Raul Estudio, um, who's a postdoc at Caltech working with um, Yisong uh, Yi, who's been a, a sort of a member of our Real Mel community and uh, participant and core organizer of our workshop series for a couple of years now. Um, Raul uh, obtained his PhD from um, the ORIE department at Cornell, um, where he worked with Peter Fraser. Um, he's been a visiting researcher um, at Meta uh, with the adaptive experimentation team. And he's done a lot of great work on uh, Bayesian methods for efficient sequential data collection, both on the methodology side, as well as uh, working on applications in areas such as robotics, uh, materials design, uh, cellular agriculture, uh, science, and more. So, Raul, thank you so much for uh, speaking with us, with us today, and please take it away. Yes, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Willie, and thanks everyone for the invitation to give this talk. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to be talking about my work on composite-based and optimization and how we can use this for um, more efficient and scalable adaptive experimentation. Um, and I would like to start my talk with these two quotes, uh, which I think reflect two important aspects of experimentation. And they're gonna be kind of important in my talk. So the first one is that experimentation is universal in the sense that it is present in pretty much every aspect of life. In particular, it is key in science and engineering. And that's the reason why we're very interested in doing efficient experimentation. The second one is that experimentation is more often active uh, rather than passive. That means that we're gonna be running new experiments based on the insights and uh, the knowledge that we get from previous ones. So with these two things in, in mind, I would like to provide a bit more detail about the structure of modern experimentation tasks. On the left, we have the experiment designer, uh, which can be a human, a computer, and more often it is a combination of these two. And on the right, we have the experiment platform, which can be a computer cluster, a social network, a robot, or some laboratory. So the workflow is as follows. The experiment designer is gonna choose the experiment configuration that is gonna be run. This is gonna be passed as an input to the experiment platform. The experiment is gonna be run here. This is gonna be potentially expensive in the sense that it, maybe it's gonna cost a lot of money or it's gonna take a lot of time. So afterwards, we're gonna get some measurement, some, some outcome of this experiment. And this outcome is gonna be used by the experiment designer to update his knowledge or her knowledge of the system. This, this new knowledge is gonna be used to choose a new experiment configuration and this process is gonna be repeated. So we see that this process is, is adaptive as I was saying before, and it is goal oriented. So very often this is formulated as some sort of optimization problem or a prediction problem. So we're gonna be gathering data towards solving some specific downstream task. And this, this kind of problem shows up in a wide range of applications, for example, in hyperparameter tuning of neural networks when we are trying to minimize the training loss uh, and we're training our neural network in a computing cluster, we're gonna be sweeping uh, various configurations of the hyperparameters until we find one that actually achieves a, a loss that is satisfactory for our application. It also shows up in e-commerce platform design. For example, companies such as Meta and Uber run A-B tests to improve their platforms um, and they vary things like the font size or the number of items they are showing uh, per every page so that they improve some metric of performance um, with respect to some known standard. It also shows up in robot control where we are trying to maybe tune a parameterized policy so that the robot is able to perform some uh, activity, some specific activity in a satisfactory way, such as switching an object. And it also shows up in higher stakes applications such as rock discovery, where we need to search over a space of thousands, potentially millions of compounds until we found uh, one that is actually able to achieve some desired effect, such as curing a disease. So with the increasing complexity of this uh, experimentation tasks, um, the need for automated and efficient approaches 
to solve this task has become more and more important. And the machine learning community has responded to this uh, need by developing several frameworks for adaptive experimentation. Some popular examples include adaptive learning, based on optimization and multi arm bandits. In active learning, the goal is to discover some truth. So we're gonna be gathering data so that the model that we get after uh, gathering all this data is as accurate as possible. Then we have Bayesian optimization, where the goal is to find some uh, notion of a best item, such as the most effective cancer drug. And we also have multi arm bandits, where the goal is to maximize some notion of reward over time. And this shows up, for example, in recommender systems. So the focus of this talk is gonna be on Bayesian optimization, but I think the, the main takeaway uh, of the talk applies more broadly to all these frameworks. Um, so Bayesian optimization, probably many of you are familiar with this. Um, I'm gonna be talking about like some of the basics of Bayesian optimization. It has been successful in many adaptive experimentation tasks, many of the uh, applications that I mentioned before. However, there are still some important applications uh, out of the reach of Bayesian optimization methods. I think a natural example is, is drug discovery. Drug discovery is an extremely challenging adaptive experimentation task due to many reasons. One is that it has multiple stages and each stage is, is extremely expensive. So things like running um, in vitro studies up to all the way up to clinical trials and getting FDA review can take uh, in the order of 10 to 15 years. So this is, this is very um, expensive. Also, there are, the space is inherently combinatorial, which also makes the search uh, very complicated. So Bayesian optimization methods are still not there to be solved uh, this kind of problem. So now the question is, what is Bayesian optimization to be successful in this kind of high stakes application? Um, there are many possible answers, but in this talk, I'm gonna try to emphasize that it is missing all the internal structure of the problem. And to be more concrete, uh, by, by what I mean by uh, internal structure, let me introduce another example, which is uh, about biologics manufacturing. Um, and you can think of this process as, um, as two process within the drug discovery pipeline. So here the goal is to produce some proteins and this process has multiple stages. In the first stage, we're gonna be using a cell culture to produce the proteins. And this cell culture is gonna produce these proteins along with some other byproducts. And later there's a purification stage where we're gonna be um, <clears throat> extracting the proteins uh, from the byproducts. And finally, there's this stage where we're gonna be, um, let's say making the proteins in a way that can be used um, by some vaccine, for example. So here the goal is to tune all the decision variables in these stages so that in the end, we maximize the amount of protein produced. So in principle, we could apply something like Bayesian optimization, formulate this as a giant uh, optimization problem, but Bayesian optimization will be missing very valuable information, namely the intermediate outputs produced in these stages which can carry information that is very, very relevant for optimization. Suppose, for example, that we observe that the amount of protein produced in this first stage, the raw protein, along with the other right products, is actually very small. Then it doesn't really matter what we do with the other decision variables. In the end, the amount of protein we're gonna get is very, very small, right? Because in these other stages, protein is not produced. We're just purifying and, and uh, transforming these proteins, but no new protein is gonna be produced. Essentially, this allows us to reduce the dimensionality of the search space. And now by observing this intermediate output, we can kind of focus our efforts on improving the decision variables in this first stage before we actually start playing with the decision variables in subsequent stages. So the issue, the fundamental issue of standard Bayesian optimization is that it treats the computation of the objective function as a black box. And we're gonna see that we can do better if we actually look inside this box and leverage this additional information. And I'm not gonna go into the details of these plots, but uh, what we're gonna see is that there are some applications where we can do a lot better by leveraging this additional information. And here I'm showing a gray box method in red, 
And what I want to highlight is the dramatic performance improvement that we can get by leveraging this, this additional information with respect to standard base and optimization benchmarks. And this idea of leveraging additional information within Bayesian optimization is broadly known in the literature as gray box Bayesian optimization. And work in this area can be broadly categorized into three research lines, which are Bayesian optimization of composite objective functions, Bayesian optimization with multi-fidelity evaluations, and Bayesian optimization with objective constituent evaluations. In this talk, I'm gonna focus on the first category, Bayesian optimization of composite functions, and in particular, I'm going to be focusing on these uh, two papers uh, from ICML 2019 and Europe's 2021. OK, so remind, the remainder of this talk is going to be organized as follows. First, I'm going to provide a very quick introduction to standard based and optimization. Um, as I said before, I'm pretty sure many of you are familiar with this, but this just to introduce some fundamental concepts and also to make sure that uh, everyone's on the same page. Then I'm gonna talk about composite Bayesian optimization, which is the main content of this talk. And then I'm gonna conclude while offering some um, broader perspective on a framework for adaptive experimentation in complex real world settings. Okay, so let's start with uh, standard Bayesian optimization. So here we want to solve optimization problems where the objective function is expensive or time consuming to evaluate. We also make no assumptions. So F lacks uh, concavity or other structure that will be convenient for optimization. Otherwise, we will probably be using a different type of algorithm. And it is also often the case that gradient information is unavailable, even though there, there are a few papers that talk about incorporating gradient information within base and optimization. So this, this so virtually we're not making any assumptions. So this is very general. Uh, many real world problems have these characteristics. Um, and that's the reason why Bayesian optimization has become very popular. And there are other derivative free optimization methods such as evolutionary strategies, simulated annealing, uh, radial basis functions methods. Uh, but these methods actually require in the order of thousands up to millions of evaluations. So they're really not applicable in the kind of problem that we're gonna be interested in. So I'm not going to be discussing this in, in my talk. OK, so a Bayesian optimization algorithm has two main components. The first one is a probabilistic model of the objective function. And this is going to allow us to make predictions about the objective function value at points that we haven't evaluated yet. And the second component is the acquisition function, which is going to take these predictions and it's going to quantify the value of making a new evaluation at uh, any given point. So let's start with the probabilistic model. There are many possible choices and things like random forest and Bayesian neural networks have been used in the literature, but arguably Gaussian processes are the most popular. So I'm not gonna go into the details of Gaussian processes, but let me just mention very quickly the formal definition of a Gaussian process. A function f is gonna set to follow a Gaussian process distribution with mean and covariance functions uh, mu and k. If for any finite collection of points in the, in the domain x1 through xn, the joint distribution of the values f of x1 through f of xn, and I'm using this compact notation, this is a vector, um, is multivariate normal with this mean vector and this covariance matrix. So again, I'm not going to go into the details, but the advantages of GPs is that they are flexible, so they allow the incorporation of prior information via the mean function and the covariance function. So things like the smoothness of the function can be incorporated via these two functions. They are by no means perfect, but they often provide reasonable uncertainty quantification. And very often they also provide tractable inference. So in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on Gaussian processes, but many of the ideas that I'm, I'm gonna be discussing here apply more broadly to other uh, probabilistic models. And this is what a Gaussian process model looks like. So we have some uh, observations of the objective function that are emanating from this underlying function here that I'm showing with this gray dashed line. Then once we fit the Gaussian process, what we're going to get is a posterior mean function, which is shown as the solid orange line. And the covariance function is going to allow us to quantify uncertainty around this um, mean prediction. The second component is acquisition function. And again, there are many possible choices. 
Here I'm going to be focusing on the speculative improvement, which again is arguably one of the most popular acquisition functions in the literature. And let me take a moment to explain where the name of this acquisition comes from. If Fn star is the best observed objective value so far, then the positive part of f of x minus Fn star is quantifying how much we are improving with respect to the current best observed value. So we are just taking the expectation with respect to the posterior distribution, and that's where the name comes from. I would like to also highlight the property of the expected improvement that is going to be important later in my talk, which is that when we model F as a Gaussian process, uh, the expected improvement has a closed form expression in terms of the mean and covariance functions. And this has been key because it means that it is very easy to compute this acquisition function, and therefore it is um, easy to optimize it. And this is what the expected improvement acquisition function looks like for the Gaussian process model that I showed before. So now let's see a Bayesian optimization algorithm in action. So there's this underlying function that we're trying to maximize and we have some uh, observed evaluations. So we're gonna fit this Gaussian process. The Gaussian process is gonna give rise to an acquisition function. I would like to note that the acquisition function is, is high or has large values at points where the posterior mean is large, but also where the posterior uncertainty is large. Actually, in this case, since observations are um, noise-free, you can see that the acquisition value at these points is, is zero. So there's no, no need to uh, evaluate these, these points again. So the acquisition function is telling us to evaluate here. So this is the point that provides more value in terms of the spectral improvement. So we're gonna go ahead and perform that evaluation. This is gonna be expensive, it's gonna take a long time. Or, um, then afterwards, we're gonna update our probabilistic model. Um, this is gonna be reflected in the new acquisition function, which is now telling us to evaluate here. And we're gonna repeat this process several times until we are satisfied with the quality of the solution found, or more often until we exhaust our evaluation budget. Okay, so this marks the end of the section on base and optimization. Uh, this is probably a good time for questions, uh, clarifying questions, if there are any. Yeah. And there are also no questions in chat. So, okay. I guess, I guess we can continue. Okay, yeah, let's move forward. Okay, so. Now we're going to talk about composite Bayesian optimization. And we're going to start by considering a very simple class of composite objective functions. This is from my ICML 2018 paper. So here we're going to consider functions that um, are the composition of two functions, an inner function H, which is um, expensive to evaluate, typically a black box, and an outer function G, which is cheap to evaluate, and typically something that we know in closed form. So this is a very simple class of composite objective functions. This kind of structure shows up in a wide range of applications. So in particular, here I, I'm gonna talk very briefly about an example uh, that showed up when I was working as an intern at ExxonMobil. Uh, at ExxonMobil, we had this very expensive reservoir simulator and we wanted to tune the parameters. We wanted to calibrate this simulator to some observed data. So we did something slightly more complicated that what I'm gonna describe here, but the, the main idea is, is the same. So we had this vector of observed data um, and in, in our context, this, this was the pressures at some test wells in, in the simulator. And we wanted the output of the simulator to match this observed data as closely as possible. So what we did is formulate this problem as a nonlinear least squares problem. And you can see how the objective function naturally has this this composite structure. So the key idea behind the approach that I'm gonna describe here is that observing the inner function h of x can be highly beneficial. And that's gonna be especially true when h carries information that is relevant for optimization, but is not available from observations of uh, the objective function alone. And I would also like to emphasize that this data is available for free, right? We're getting this the inner observations as part of the computation of the objective function. Uh, however, standard Bayesian optimization does not use this information. So 
that can be potentially wasteful, as we're going to see. So, so Raul, may, may I ask a quick question? Sure, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering what's the dimensionality of uh, age of X versus X? Right, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, in this problem that I actually I was tackling a few years ago, the dimensionality of uh, H was small. So K, which is the number of outputs of the function H, was very small. It was in the order of 5 to 10, whereas the input dimension was in the order of 10 to 20. Um, so it is, in many applications, the, mm -hmm. output, the output of the function H is smaller than the input dimension. Mm -hmm. However, now there are papers that actually have gone very high on the output dimension in the order of tens of thousands. There's a paper uh, titled high dimensional, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, Bayesian optimization with high dimensional outputs. Mm -hmm. It actually talks about composite Bayesian optimization and how we can do inference in, for this setting where we have many, many outputs. Can you, can you maybe also, great, this answers my question. Uh, can, can you also a bit motivate like optimizing in the SpaceX versus optimizing in the space uh, of age of X, right? Uh, I see. So you're right. Okay. Yeah, I will say that X is actually the thing that you control, right? Those are the decision variables. Uh, right. But given that G is known, right? Given that G is known, we can we can also optimize G, right? Directly. Sure. In the, uh, in the smaller dimensional space, age of X. Or am I missing something? Right. No. Okay. Yeah. I guess the H of X is the part that is a black box, right? So this space, H of X, mm -hmm. is something that actually is not available to you. So maybe you have an idea of what H of X corresponds, but it is sure, not. But, but G is known, right? G, G is known, right? But what over which domain are you going to be optimizing G? If uh, H, RK? Uh, so in principle, RK is not like the whole image of, of the function okay. H, right? So potentially you're going to be solving a different optimization problem okay. unless you take into consideration what H of X is. Yeah. Okay, that answers my question. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, great. Yeah, that, that was a great question. Okay, great. Yeah, so let me just uh, say this again. So the idea is that observing this, this inner information can be highly beneficial um, and the data is just available for free. So we should use it somehow. Um, so now let me go very quickly over this toy example about why observing this inner function can be highly beneficial. And this is a toy version of the calibration problem that I was describing before. So here X is gonna be a single parameter. So this is gonna be uh, a number in zero one. We're also gonna assume that the C, this um, output of this simulator is real valid. So there's a single um, value that we want to tune. And without loss of generality, we're going to assume that our data is y equals zero. But this is the calibration problem that we want to solve. So let's see what standard Bayesian optimization will do when solving this problem. It's going to use observations of the objective function, and it's going to place, it's going to build this Gaussian process distribution, which is in turn going to give rise to the acquisition function. And in this case, the acquisition function, which is expected improvement, is telling us to evaluate around here. This decision is not terrible because we are reducing uncertainty in this region, but we can see that we, we could definitely make a much better sampling decision. In particular, we are not improving over the best known solution. And recall that this is a minimization problem. So the best solution is, is this one. Now let's see what an approach that has access to observations of the inner function H um, will do. So here we not only have access to observations of the objective function, we actually have access to observations of the inner function H. So let's, let me highlight a piece of information that is available to us from observing this inner function. So observe that this function is negative around 0 0.5 and it is positive around 0 0.8. So if this function is continuous, which is often the case, then there's going to be a point between these two points so that h of x is equal to zero. And that corresponds to a global minimum of the objective function. So if now, instead of fitting directly some model on the objective function, we actually fit a model on the inner function h and then consider 
the implied model on the objective function f, this, this information is actually carried away by, by this model. And it can now be used by our acquisition function to make a much better sampling decision, which in this case is, is around this point, And it's pretty close to that level optimum. And there's no coincidence. Uh, the fact that we are leveraging this information is what's allowing us to make this much better sampling decision. OK, so now the question is, how do we leverage? Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. We have a question by Kevin. Oh, sure. Go for it. Yeah, thank you. I'm just trying to clarify this slide, right? So before and on previous slide, it looked like f of x was a sum of square errors of h. Was that right? Right, right. That's right. Yeah. And so the f here is just kind of minimizing the function. So the, for practical terms, h was is like our GP. Is that right? And h, h, h is the error, right? h is the GP. That that's right. Yeah. Okay. So if this is an optimization, we're we're minimizing here, right? Right. That's right. So I, I just, I'm not clear why having the threshold value zero is important because don't we just want to go as far negative as we can? I, I'm not following the, your- Oh, okay. So let, let me go back to the definition of the optimization problem. This is a problem that we're trying to solve, yeah. right? And y is equal to zero, I'm assuming, uh, right? So the minimum of this optimization problem or the solution corresponds to a point if it exists so that h of x is equal to zero, right? Because we're okay. squaring this. So I'm just saying that actually it turns out that this, this function h can, is negative, right? Around this point and it's positive around this point. So by the mean uh, function value theorem, there's gonna be a point so that h of x is equal to zero, right? And that corresponds to that level minimum of the okay. objective function. Yeah. All right, got it. thanks. Yeah, sure. I have a question. So why expected improvement? Do we, can we already see what is the reason to use that and on some other acquisition function? Or, you know, in this example, you could use any, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I'm just using expected improvement as an example. But in principle, the same idea could be applied to any acquisition function. All right, thanks. OK, great. OK, so the question is, how do we leverage this, this inner observations of, of the function H? And essentially, I already told you how we're gonna do that. So we're gonna be modeling this inner function uh, instead of the objective function directly. And then we're gonna compute an acquisition function with respect to the implied model on the objective function. And here, just to make things more concrete, I'm gonna assume we're gonna be modeling H as a multi-output Gaussian process. And this is a simple generalization of the single output Gaussian process that I discussed before. But now the main function maps inputs to ve uh, vectors in RK, and the covariance function maps um, pairs of inputs to K by K matrices. And again, the, the ideas I'm going to discuss apply more broadly. In particular, this paper from 2021 also uh, discusses composite Bayesian optimization using deep neural net base and deep neural networks. So other models can be used too. Okay, so the main challenge that we face by this new approach is that, uh, and um, I would like to emphasize that this was a challenge, especially back in the day in 2019. Nowadays it is pretty much standard, uh, but the challenge is that uh, the posterior distribution on the objective function is non-Gaussian. Right, because we're transforming this Gaussian distribution by something nonlinear. So in general, we're gonna get something that is non-Gaussian. And this is gonna complicate the computation and maximization of most acquisition functions. In particular, this expected improvement that previously had a nice closed form expression that we could use to optimize this acquisition function no longer has a closed form expression. So this is something we need to deal with. And before I, I discuss the general approach to uh, to deal with this non-Gaussian distribution. I'm gonna discuss a special case, and this uh, from the work of Hiren Holt and Jensen, also from 2019, which considers a special case in which this function G is a sum of square errors. So um, a square Euclidean distance with respect to some observation. But this is very similar to the calibration problem that I was discussing before. So what they note in their work is that the implied posterior distribution is a generalized chi-square. So a distribution that is kind of familiar to us. And they use this to derive an approximate loss form expression for the expected improvement 
acquisition function and also for the um, UCB. And here, that's nice because they get again this flows from expression. So it is very efficient to optimize this acquisition function. However, it is unclear what this approximation is really doing. So we are not sure how good or how close uh, the solution that we get by optimizing this approximation is with respect to the true optimal solution of the acquisition function. And uh, moreover, this is not something that we can easily generalize to other functions too. So the way we're gonna tackle the general case is via something known as the reparameterization trick, which is also very standard. And this is just um, a way of kind of a fancy way to say that the posterior distribution of HFX can be written as, uh, can be decomposed as the posterior mean plus the Cholesky factor of the covariance uh, function times C, where C is a okay, k-dimensional, the standard normal bandwidth. So this allows us to rewrite the expected improvement as the expectation of this subject. And everything here inside this expectation is, is deterministic. It's something that we can compute in closed form and it's differentiable. And all the randomness is encapsulated in this uh, standard normal random vector C. So this is gonna give rise to a very efficient approach to optimize the expected improvement, which is known in the operations research literature as sample average approximation. And this approach is based on fixing M samples from this standard normal distribution, and then considering the Monte Carlo approximation of the expected improvement that we get by fixing this, these samples. So we're gonna take this as a proxy of the true uh, acquisition function, and then we're gonna optimize it. And the benefit is that now this problem that previously was in principle an a stochastic optimization problem, it is deterministic and moreover, it is amenable to auto differentiation, auto differentiation tools in, in PyTorch, for example. The concern is how large should M be? So how many samples do we need in order for this approximation to be good and hopefully recover something that is close to what will be recovered if we have the true um, acquisition function. So let's let's see what happens in, in practice for a very simple uh, 1D problem. So on the top panel, we have the true acquisition function, and this is the point that maximizes this acquisition function. And on the bottom panel, we have an approximation that we get for M equals four samples. And you can see that globally, this approximation is not very good. And the solution that we are finding, even though it's, it's relatively close to the true solution, is also not, not very good. And this, this is a 1D example, so this can actually get worse when the dimension is, is higher. But as we start increasing the number of samples, this approximation becomes uh, better. In particular, for M equals 16 samples, um, the point that we recover by optimizing this approximation is actually very close to the true optimal solution, even though the global approximation is still not great. So we can keep increasing the number of samples and we see how this approximation very quickly becomes extremely good until for 20, sorry, for 256 samples, it's pretty hard to distinguish between the ground truth and, and this approximation. And it turns out that we can back up this with some theory and show that the solution that we find by maximizing this approximation converges exponentially fast in probability in the sense of uh, the distance to the true optimal solution uh, at an exponential rate. So this is something that was first shown in this paper by Ballandat et al. So the, the Spotorch paper. And we also generalized this to more complicated complete functions in our 2019 paper. So what this means is that in practice, we can use a very small number of samples. For example, I typically use around 64 to 100 samples, <clears throat> and this is gonna work uh, very well. So this approach is gonna be very computationally efficient. And in particular, it's not gonna be very different from optimizing an acquisition function with a closed form expression. Are there any questions? So I would have a question. So what is alpha and what are the regularity conditions? I'm just a bit, uh, I am not familiar with this result. Sure, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm not providing the details. This is kind of an informal statement of the result. 
what we need to assume is some Lipschitz conditions on the posterior mean function and covariance functions. Uh, so these constants are actually going to depend on on the Lipschitz constants uh, that we assume here. But this saying that essentially when we fix some epsilon uh, greater than zero, then the probability that the solution we find by optimizing this approximation, um, the distance of this solution to a true optimal solution of the original problem, um, the probability that this distance is greater than epsilon is going to go exponentially fast to zero as the number of samples goes to infinity. And I'm, I'm not actually like this, this constant is something that we know depends on the Lipschitz constant. Uh, of the posterior mean and the posterior covariance, as well as on the some Lipschitz constant of the acquisition function, uh, but we we don't have like an explicit something more explicit than that. All right, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, so that that was kind of some of the technical stuff on composite PL. Now let me just take a moment to discuss um, how these these algorithms or this approach has had an impact in real world applications and also in, inspire uh, new computational frameworks for Bayesian optimization. So even though it has been around for only a few years, composite Bayesian optimization is now widely used in industry. And in particular, this company, Novelis, which is an, uh, one of the leading aluminum uh, companies, um, makes very heavy use of composite Bayesian optimization. We, we had a, a small collaboration with this company and essentially what they do is they formulate a bunch of nonlinear least squares problem uh, with very expensive simulators and they are not doing calibration instead what they're doing is they're they're formulating these, these problems to find compounds that match some um, desired attributes as closely as possible and this is giving rise to uh, new materials in a, in a way that is faster with respect to what we're, they were doing before. So they were also using Bayesian optimization before, but now they are leveraging the composite structure of the problem to actually uh, make this process more efficient. Composite functions are also key in the design of Bowtorch. Um, probably many of you are familiar with this Python package that was <coughs> released by Facebook. <coughs> um, and their, their composite Bayesian optimization can be trivially implemented in, in, in Bowtorch. So something like the approach that I was describing in the previous slide, which is this expected improvement, can be implemented in Bowtorch in less than 10 lines of code. So if you have a problem that actually has a composite structure, I will encourage you to try Bowtorch and leverage this structure to hopefully do more efficient uh, adaptive experimentation. Okay, so so far I have focused on this very simple class of composite objective functions. And I'm not gonna go into the details, but I, I just wanna highlight that this approach can be extended to a much more general class of composite functions, uh, something we call causal function networks. In these networks, uh, we have a, a series of functions, H1 through H6 in this case. And here the assumption is that each of these functions in the network is taking as input the output of its parent nodes. And this, this kind of structure shows up in many of the applications that I was describing. In particular, it shows up in this biologics manufacturing process um, that I was describing before. So here the output of every stage is being passed as an input to the subsequent stage, right? So this naturally has this function, causal function network structure. So the way we generalize this approach to this more general class of composite objective functions is by observing that the conditional distribution of each of these node functions, given the value of its parent nodes is still Gaussian. So that's gonna allow us to apply the reparameterization trick at every of, the, of these nodes. And then we're gonna be able to build a sample recursively. So what's gonna happen is we're gonna be able to draw samples for these three nodes, H1, H2, and H3, uh, following the standard reparameterization trick. Then we're gonna fix the values or we're gonna condition on the values of these nodes to be equal to, to these samples. 
and conditional on that information, the distribution on these nodes is, is again gonna be Gaussian. So we can apply the reparameterization trick again, and we can do the same for this final node. So back to instruction, there's gonna be a valid sample from the posterior distribution on the objective function. So again, this approach is, is very simple. It's gonna be computationally efficient and it's amenable to auto differentiation tools. Um, so very easy to um, actually implement in, in practice in, in something like Boulders. Uh, let's see how are we doing in time. Okay, so now let, let's see what um, this more complicated approach can do in practice. So I'm gonna describe very quickly a test problem. This is inspired by the work that the analytics uh, COVID-19 team did at Cornell during the pandemic. So it was using simulators to decide whether to hold in-person classes or virtual classes. So this is kind of a simplified version of the problem they were dealing with. So there's this uh, SIS simulator. So we are, here we are trying to model the interaction or the evolution of two populations that are interacting. You can think of this as the Cornell community versus the reminder of the population in Ithaca. <clears throat> and there are some parameters governing how these two populations interact and how COVID-19 spreads across these two populations. So in the first period, so there are gonna be three periods of time. In the first period of time, we're gonna be modeling the number of infected individuals in each of these two populations. And this dynamical system is gonna evolve and it's gonna give rise to the number of infected individuals for each of these two populations in the second time period. And this is gonna depend of course on how many individuals were infected in each of these two populations in the first time period, as well as these parameters that govern how the disease spreads. So we're gonna be modeling this and the parameters are, are gonna be time dependent. So this, this is formulated as a function network. And in the end, we're gonna take these outputs and solve again, some uh, nonlinear least squares problem to find the parameters of the simulator that most closely match some observed data. So when we apply this composite Bayesian optimization approach that I was just describing, we can see that the performance we get is way, way higher, way better than what we get from a standard Bayesian optimization. In particular, this approach is, is pretty much finding an optimal solution, and, and this is normalized to be in, in zero minus one, uh, an optimal solution after just about five evaluations, whereas the standard Bayesian optimization benchmarks are not close even after a hundred evaluations. So the performance improvement that we get by leveraging this structure is actually, or it can be quite dramatic um, depending on the function network structure. Uh, in our paper, we explore other test problems, something, uh, a manufacturing problem similar to the biologics a uh, problem that I was describing before, and also a problem related to robot control, where we want to teach this robotic arm to find some, some target. And all across these problems, um, also some, uh, some other synthetic problems, we see that this composite structure can provide significant performance improvements. And as you can see in, in some of these examples, the performance improvements that we get are actually um, quite dramatic. So uh, I'm not saying that this is gonna work better than standard based and optimization all the time, uh, but definitely there are many, many problems where this is gonna work significantly better. So in practice, what I will do is actually, I will go and try this, this approach and see how, how well the model fit is. And if the model fit is, is better than the one I will get by using a GP, then potentially this approach is gonna be doing better than standard based and optimization approach. So it's actually not, not hard to distinguish for which problems this is gonna do better. Okay, so things work nicely in practice, but a, a natural question is what are the theoretical insights behind these this performance improvements that we are observing? And the honest answer is that there's still a lot to do to improve our theoretical understanding of these gray box based and optimization methods. So I'm just gonna go over um, two of the few results that I know that kind of provide some, some insight. The first one is something we showed in our NEURPS 2021 paper, which is that the expected improvement acquisition function using this composite Gaussian process model is asymptotically consistent, which means that 
after an infinite number of evaluations, it finds the, the global optimum. That is not super interesting because we are in a regime where the number of evaluations is very limited. What's interesting and what's new is that we can show this despite that uh, this equation function may not sample the domain densely. So what this is saying is that the composite structure can be leveraged to discard regions of the space after just a finite number of evaluations. And some technical assumptions are, are required to show this theorem. So I'm not saying like this fully explain the performance improvement that we're seeing in practice, but I do believe that this, this really reflects what's going on in practice. So what, what's happening really is that there are gonna be some regions of the space where some of the values of these inner functions is gonna be terrible. It's gonna be bad for some reason. So essentially, as, as soon as we find that some of these outputs is pretty bad for some of the, the functions, so some of the inner functions, this equation function is going to say it really doesn't, it doesn't make sense to take measurements in, in this region, right? So effectively, it's going to allow us to discard um, regions of the space just by observing these intermediate outputs, because these, these outputs, was, once we start thinking about how they affect the computation of the objective function, <clears throat> um, they're going to yield some pretty bad objective value. This, this, for example, to, to be more concrete, this is something similar to what we observed in the biologics manufacturing problem, where the protein at the first stage was pretty bad. So it wouldn't really matter what we do with the subsequent stages. The output that we were going to get was going to be pretty bad. So this is the first result. More recently, uh, people in, in Krauss's group showed this uh, very interesting result about uh, an UCB type of acquisition function. Essentially, they provided regret bounds for this acquisition function. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the details of this result, but I'm just going to say that actually the regret bound that they derive implies that for some kernels and for some network structures, the regret bound that you can show for this acquisition function uh, is exponentially better in the input dimension um, to what you can show using the standard UCB acquisition function. And these results are, are not necessarily comparable because if a function lies in the RKHS of some kernel, it doesn't necessarily lies in the composition of these functions in RKHSs. So it's kind of hard to compare these two results. But the, the insight that we get from this result is that if this function actually decomposes as a composite objective function, then potentially we're going to be able to solve the problem more efficiently if we leverage this structure. And also, I think this result is very intuitive. So essentially, they're saying as long as the input dimension of each of the nodes in the network is relatively small, we're going to be able to make, to make much better uh, inference or much better optimization than if we ignore this composite structure and just treat the output as, an, as um, something, as a function of the whole decision vector. Okay, so this marks the end of my discussion on composite Bayesian optimization. Uh, we are near the end of my talk, so I'm just going to take a moment very quickly to talk about um, some of my other work in, in and how this fits into our research agenda towards having adaptive experimentation in more complex settings. So I, here I talk about composite uh, objective functions and composite models. I do believe this is going to be key to scale based and optimization to these more complicated settings. But definitely, this, this, this is not the only consideration to be able to scale based and optimization. Another consideration that shows up very often in, in practice and that I think is going to be key is the fact that in many of these problems, we have multiple and highly heterogeneous data sources. For example, in this drug discovery problem that I was describing before, we're probably going to have historical data. We're going to have data from low fidelity simulators. We're going to have data from high fidelity simulators. We're going to have maybe preference data expressed by some scientist or a manager. And we're going to have super expensive <clears throat> lab data. So we would like to be able to use all these sources of data in concert <clears throat> to make better and more efficient sampling decisions. So this requires in principle, <clears throat> sorry, first having a model that actually can integrate all these sources of data seamlessly 
So composite models are going to play a role in doing that. But in addition, we also need acquisition functions <coughs> sorry, that understand how to manage these sources of data and how to trade off the information they provide versus the cost of uh, these sources of data. Also, to be able to leverage these data sources, I do believe it is going to be key to learn efficient data representations on the fly. So uh, I'm, I'm confident that things such as combining Bayesian optimization with deep kernel learning are going to become more and more uh, a standard in the future, and they're going to be very useful to scale uh, Bayesian optimization to these, these problems. Um, I also want to highlight the fact that preference information is going to be key. There are many adaptive experimentation pipelines where human intervention, intervention is still highly required. So for some of these applications, we don't really want to take the human out of the loop. We just might want to make the process of extracting information from humans more efficient. And we want to think about this process as a sub process within the adaptive experimentation pipeline, as opposed to think about this as something in isolation. Uh, finally, I think it's going to be key to use context-aware sampling policies, and by by me by this I mean policies that understand that there may be safety or risk constraints uh, that must be taken into account when making decisions uh, about when to sample. Um, so this this um, I also have a couple of papers related to that, and I know there there's. Uh, it's something that the Bayesian optimization community has been thinking about for the last few years. OK, so now let me summarize my talk very quickly. So here I talk about uh, composite structure and how this improves or how this can be used to improve the efficiency and the scalability of Bayesian optimization methods. There are many cool applications from robot control to material design. And potentially, uh, at some point, we're going to be able to do drug discovery with these kind of approaches. And I believe there are many exciting directions for future research. But things like improving the computational scalability of these methods is going to be very important. As Ilja was asking about the number of outputs of this intermediate function, when the number of outputs is very large, actually, that can become very computationally demanding. So in order to really be able to use these methods in large scale problems, we're going to have to develop new computational techniques that allows us to, to handle that type of scenarios. I also believe there's an opportunity to develop um, deeper theory in this setting. I'm very happy to see that other people are actually becoming interested in improving um, regret bounds and convergence results for gray box based and optimization methods. And definitely there's still a lot to do in this area. Um, finally, I, I believe I, here in this talk, I focus on Bayesian optimization, but I believe that this idea of leveraging internal structure can be more broadly applied in the other adaptive experimentation frameworks that I discussed earlier in my talk. And of course, there's also an opportunity to explore other gray box structures, both within Bayesian optimization and in any of these other adaptive experimentation frameworks. Great, so I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge my wonderful collaborators, um, all these people, uh, some of them from UC Davis, from Meta, from Georgia Tech, and of course, Peter from, from Cornell, who was my PhD advisor. Uh, all this work will not be possible without uh, their support and their insights. And here are a few references uh, about the papers that I briefly discussed here. And those highlighted in orange correspond to the papers that focus on composite based and optimization. Great, so that's the end of my talk. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Raul. Uh, it was a great talk. Uh, let's see if we have some questions. Uh, so, so everybody, feel free to unmute yourself and and ask questions to to Raul. Hi, this is uh, Jacob. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Can you talk a bit more about the causal networks because that sounds interesting? And I was wondering if you have a deeper idea in regards to Perlian causal networks, or was there just something that intuitively evolved out of your thinking? Sure. Uh, let's see. Let me go back very quickly. Yeah, I believe this is, is very interesting. It's it's something that um, I started exploring in this paper. 
currently there are other interesting research directions. For example, um, something that none of the existing works has or has properly addressed, I will say, is that in these causal function networks, it is very often the case that you can make evaluations for only a subset of the nodes, right? But that, that's not taken into account by the method that I described here. In particular, if you want to think about an acquisition function, such as the spectral improvement, then you need to be thinking about evaluating the whole network so that actually getting an improvement makes sense. So I believe there is an opportunity to develop a more sophisticated acquisition functions, such as generalizations of the knowledge gradient or um, entropy search to be able to handle things like partial evaluations or asynchronous evaluations of the networks, of the nodes in, in the network. Um, yeah, uh, do you have any, any specific questions about this? No, I, f I find it interesting. Um, so I've been reading Virginia Aglietti's work on causal Bayesian optimization. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Right, yeah, the result I was just talking about, it, it's, probably, uh, it's probably the same paper you're describing, right? Is, is it this paper? No, no, causal Bayesian optimization. Okay, so without the model base. Yeah, it's, it's from 2020. Um, I but I mean, you know, it's all going the same direction, I guess. But um, they, they do obviously, um, for example, propose an acquisition function where you don't have interventions on all nodes, but they also consider general intervention sets. So there's a different direction. It comes from the pure causal mindset. Um, that's right. Yeah, that's right. I, I believe this paper, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this paper, discusses the paper you're talking about. And it provides a nice unification between um, the work that I did on function networks and a more, um, uh, you know, a perspective closely related to the causal inference literature. In particular, this paper discusses both uh, hard interventions and soft interventions and develops an acquisition function that uh, works for both. Okay, yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Sure, yeah, thank you. Do you have time for maybe one more question? Yeah, sure. Uh, any questions? We can also stop the recording and ask. Sure. Maybe questions. Which...